All right, hi everybody and uh, welcome. I am here with uh, JJ Allaire. My name is Jeremy Howard and um, we are having what I originally was very proud of myself for inventing the idea of a two-way AMA. I wondered why other people haven't come up with this idea. And then I realized, oh, I think I just invented another name for a conversation. So yeah. this is either a conversation with JJ Allaire or a two-way <laughs> AMA. We'll see if it turns out to be any different. So okay. good day, JJ. Thanks for joining. Great, 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 great being here. Um, so uh, uh, I always like to find out a little bit about, you know, um, uh, people's environs. Where are you talking to us from today? I'm talking to you from my home in uh, in uh, Newton, Massachusetts. In Newton, Massachusetts? Newton, New Newton yeah. And so where is like that? It's like, um, it's it's kind of due east, uh, due west of the city, sorry, um, maybe 15 minutes outside of downtown. So mm -hmm. it's kind of an inner, inner, inner ring suburb. So. And um, why why there? Is this where you've always been, or it's your favorite place no, in the world? No, not, not even close. No, I started in, I grew up in, I was in Philadelphia till I was 13, and then I, I, was, I moved to Minnesota. I was there for a long time, till I was about 30. And then I, um, and then I moved to Boston because of work, because of the company I was working with, and then I just ended up um, staying here. So, um, and then I'm, I'm here because my, the, public schools here are great. And so I probably, all other things considered, live in the city, but for the time being, I, I want to take advantage of the, the yeah. great public schools. Here, Boston's so. a great town. I, yeah, it is. I spent quite a bit of time there when I set up an office in one of my earlier companies there. And I uh, got very into the Boston Red Sox, as you do. Yeah, and, yeah, um, yeah. Got very into the tennis and racket club and oh, got yeah, very I into have Boston a, life. I, I have a very good friend I used to be a member of Tennis and Racket, and I have a very good friend there who's who's still a big plays there quite a bit. So yeah, that's a, that's a gem. Yeah, that's no, it's a, it's so a beautiful in, town, and I also I loved that I you know because I didn't know anybody. Yeah, it's definitely a town where you could just go to a random bar, sit down, yeah. watch the game, yeah. and whoever's around you will, will chat. Be interesting yeah. to talk to. Yeah. yeah, that's true. So you end up you're in Australia now. I am in Australia now. Yeah. And you were in Australia before. Yeah. Yeah, so we, I'm in, I'm in Queensland, um, yeah. which is a kind of, well, the part I'm in is kind of a subtropical um, beachside town. Um, yep. It's, it's not a resort town, but it's kind of like the nearest capital city is Brisbane, which is like four or five million people, and it's the nearest kind of beach town that people would go to for a weekend or something. I see. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's I always wanted to live in Queensland. Um, never understood why everybody didn't want to live in Queensland. And now that I'm here, I'm even more convinced everybody would yeah, okay. live in Queensland. And the university is in Queensland too. It's not like Yeah, so the university is in Brisbane. So I'm, I'm a binary professor at the University of Queensland, which is 45 minutes from here. Okay. Um, so I, when I teach there, I yeah, just drive in and do my thing, yeah. drive home. Cool. Um, and then in between, you were in Boston and California and all. all yeah, that. so I grew up in Melbourne, which seemed like the center of the world at the time. And I never understood why people talked about Australia as being far away, because it seemed pretty close yeah. to me. And But then, yeah, moving to San Francisco, I stayed there for 10 years um, for a previous startup called Kaggle, um, yeah. and suddenly realized, yeah, God, Melbourne is a very long way away, mm -hmm. um, physically and everything else. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I do now feel like it's a very good experience for somebody who grows up away from a kind of intellectual center like that yeah. to yeah. spend some time yeah. living in one yeah. just yeah. to yeah. experience yeah. that for sure and yeah so tell me about what you're doing now so you're the ceo of our studio yeah, our, our studio which um which i started that about 11 i don't know 11 or 12 years ago and that was started off originally as just an open source uh ide for our um, and it was just, it was not actually intended as a company. It was just me and one other person. 
and we had worked on lots of development tools and programming languages and authoring tools and in our previous lives. And I had um, been involved in, in, in graduate school and uh, as an undergrad in social sciences and statistical programming in the social sciences. And I sort of originally that was what, what, was what I wanted to make my career. Uh, and then I kind of got swept up into software. And so when I, um, I had finished with the startup and then I found out about R and I said, wow, there's an open source statistical programming system. That's cool. I really would like to work in open source. And it sort of, with, as you know, is written by statisticians for statisticians, which gave it a lot of things, you know, a lot of things they got right, but then some of the, the software tooling part they, they, they struggled with. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, here's, I can make a contribution here. I, I know the tooling part and, and I'd like to see this project get, get used by more people. So we just started working on that, on the IDE. And then, um, so that was just a couple of us. And then uh, long story short, we ended up getting to know Hadley Wickham and he was working on what was then not the tidyverse, but the dplyr and ggplot and things. And we said, let's, let's all work together. And then that sort of begged the question of, well, how, how is it that we're gonna all work together and make sure everyone gets paid and everything. So we said, well, let's try to make a company out of this. And we did that by sort of you know, building um, sort of uh, enterprise grade ex sort of servers that made it easier to adopt a lot of our open source software. In, in like long yeah, I, I knew Hadley from before our studio because yeah. of course everybody in Australia and New Zealand knows each other. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I remember actually hanging out with him in, in Texas and he was yeah. then at uh, Rice University. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and uh, he was already famous, um, yeah. you know, for his yeah. amazing contributions. Yeah. And and uh, he he was saying to me, you know, I was saying like, wow, you know, the university must love having somebody like you there. And he's like, yeah. no, quite the opposite. <laughs> yeah. You know, they yeah. don't appreciate it at all, and I yeah. struggle to get support for what I'm doing. Yeah, and I just like thought, shit, you know, what a how you know, what a terrible here? thing about academia is going on yeah, here. Yeah, I know. I, and I know. so glad when he found you, him yeah, and he, we, you know, you found him and he found you and that yeah. seems to worked well. Yes, it has. So, so that's good. And then the, co and the companies has developed well. And so that's, you know, um, afforded. One of the projects I worked on was R Markdown, which was kind of a lit literate programming system for R. And that actually started working on that about 10 years ago. And, um, and that we, we had a lot of success with that, but it was like very, it, it was quite narrow in a sense in that it was- Why, why did you do that? You had some previous interest in literate programming? Um, you know, honestly, I, there were two things that happened. I, there were a bunch of the, the I was working with a bunch of uh, faculty who were teaching R and they were teaching, they were, everybody was trying to, well, they were teaching at the time S-Weave which was this sort of LaTeX based literate programming environment that, that was built into R. And they were doing that because they wanted to teach people literate programming and reproducible workflow, but that, that they're teaching them LaTeX, which was really- But that's not, unusual not, already, right? Like not many people- That's are, unusual already, yeah. R had programming. this thing, S we've built into it, you know, in like 2007 or so. I mean, it, they were way ahead of, of, or even before, like, so, so R always had this sort of in the community and in, it was, it was actually one of the, the core members of, of the R team who built this S weave thing. So they're pushing this literate programming idea. So I kind of got infected with it by exposure to that. Cool. Um, and then at the same time, I went to use R in 2012 in um, England. And the, one of the, the people who presented was presented, did a three hour seminar on org mode and presented another system for literate programming that was more, um, you know, human readable ASCII oriented. Yeah. And so just to clarify um, for people who haven't seen it, so org mode is an, is an Emacs. It's not just a mode, but it's also a file format, that's which right, yeah. is in many ways a lot like Markdown. Um, exactly. I mean, it's not at all compatible, but it's the same basic yeah. idea, a text-based, um, you know, format, but also in org mode, your code can kind of be evaluated and the, the execute right. yeah, results of the execution exactly. appear in the document. Yeah. So it has which a, is lot a, of a lot of like what our markdown is, right? It's kind of like, a lot, a lot like it. executable so code, I, the outputs appear inside, in the document. That's exactly right. So, so it's sort of like this idea, well, we've got S weave, it's really hard to teach people a lot of tech. Some people were saying, well, is there a way we could get this into office? Can we get, can we get through this with open document? How are we gonna get people to do this without, well, not burdening them with learning LaTeX? tech? 
-hmm. When I saw org mode, I said, wow, that's a better idea mm -hmm. to me and more just ask un human readable ASCII based idea. But at the time Markdown was already really taking off and it was mm -hmm. already in, in use on GitHub. It was in use in a bunch of wiki systems. And so I said, well, let's, let's take the, the core ideas of org mode and sweep and build a Markdown variant then. Um, and, and I did it with R because that's the, that's the environment I was working in. It, it was just, it had sort of blinders on, like, let's just make this work in the environment. That and and you were personally like doing stuff with literate programming yourself and found it useful or you're just- yeah, I found it useful because I was building websites and documents. And yeah, I, I definitely was, thought this is a great way to work. Uh, and then um, and at the same time, um, Yi Hui Z was a, created, had created a package called NITR that was sort of a replacement for Sweeve. Uh, it was sort of a better, like sort of feature enhanced version of Sweeve. And at the same time, he made it open so it could do restructured text and it could do, you know, any ASCII doc and it could do Markdown. And so we, he, Yi Hui and I got together and said, let's create this thing called R Markdown, which basically says we're going to use Knitter as a computational engine. And we're going to use Markdown. Uh, at the time, it was just like we basically used Sundown, which was GitHub's Markdown pro uh, processor, and we added math. You know, so that was pretty straightforward. And these, so that was these tools all have R in them. Are they all exclusively R tools? But they they are. Uh, you they they require R to run. They're pretty much R. They now they're multi engine. So Nidar has this idea of engine. So there is a Python engine and a Julia engine. But you, you're, you're calling Python from R. You have an embedded mm. Python session in your R session. You have an embedded Julia session in your R session. So like, it's very R-centric. Even though it's multiple languages, it's very R-centric. So, it. so yeah. And then, um, uh, so we did the first iteration of it and you could, just make, you could just make web pages. And then at the same time, Pandoc was kind of evolving and people were trying to figure out, they were like, oh, let me just glue together our markdown with Pandoc and then I can make Word documents and PDFs and okay, so, so on. That, that's gonna be something a lot of people are not familiar with. So Pandoc is a yeah. uh, basically a markdown processor. It's, it's um, I think it's written in Haskell, right? Although it's a, it's it's a Haskell, compiled right, binary, right. so that like, doesn't markdown, matter for most people. Uh, yep. And yep. Um, yeah, it's kind of like a pretty, I mean, it is a kind of a markdown processor, but it can take almost any input and convert it into its markdown yeah. and then convert that into one of those any outputs. Uh, and it, so and it any text to any text. Yeah, it doesn't actually even convert it to markdown. It converts it oh, to, a, to an AFT. Internal, you know, the intermediate, text and, text and in, an internal format that's a sort of an abstract document. And so like, if you're going Word to PDF, it's never seeing markdown. It's just going yeah. into saying AFT. So and, JJ, I had used, Pandoc before yeah. talking to you about all this stuff, um, but I had used it in this very kind of naive way of yeah. just being like, yeah. oh, I've got a, a document of, yeah. you know, HTML document and I want to convert it to LaTeX or we're going to yeah. convert LaTeX to Markdown or whatever, and I just run it. Yeah. Now, what I've learned from you is that actually, you know, Pandoc has this like embedded Lua interpreter yeah. and this kind of very generic system kind of a bit like nb convert the notebook yeah, world that's right that yeah takes this input as a kind of a abstract abstract syntax tree you can munge it however you like you spit it back out you can fit that anywhere in a pandoc path yeah. to kind of yeah. construct your own it's like a doc uh, it's a pipeline of, thing. Of, it's, like a do, it's a pipeline of, of, of tr transformations to the document and the most obvious of which is, I just want to make a PDF, or I just want to make a Word document or a web page. But there's and, other. Yeah, and the other thing to mention is, I mean, as you say, it doesn't particularly require Markdown, but but you know, by the, by the way, you know, Pandoc Markdown is this fairly universal format because you can express yeah. things like divs and classes, right, and right. layouts. So then the mar yeah, the Markdown syntax you can express the the whole Pandoc AST in Pandoc Markdown. Yeah, so, so it's it's a kind of a Markdown on steroids. One of the ideas that though that was taken really seriously by John McFarlane when he created Pandoc was, so the original um, Markdown had the idea of raw HTML. Because the idea, John Gruber's idea was like, this is just an easier way to write HTML. So of course you can put raw HTML in there. If there's nothing, if it's something isn't in Markdown, just go ahead and add the HTML. Sure. So that's a, a good idea. But what he added, he was interested in creating uh, technical manuscripts. So he extended that to, you can, put raw LaTeX in there. And so he basically said, also you can have raw LaTeX. And he, and he made it so it was very good at, at, at generating LaTeX. 
So he sort of added this. Yeah, because there's also like, Pandoc citations, for example. And citations, right. So he added this idea of let's take LaTeX really seriously uh, in a way that other markdown processors tend not to, because that's not really their use case. There are a lot of them are, are tied to like content management systems and things that are producing web content. Uh, and then let's take uh, citations really seriously. So they had a really robust um, implementation of citations and integration with citation style language. So, you know, really first class citations and support of LaTeX and then ultimately support of, um, of office document formats and open document and things like that. So it, it was a, a more um, elaborate, comprehensive, hackable, um, you know, uh, version of Markdown. So then we, we migrated, we created sort of our Markdown V2 was based on Pandoc. And then- and how long ago was that? That was a, a couple of years. That was about, about eight years ago. I see. It, uh, so pretty early on, we moved to Pandoc, maybe even nine years ago. So pretty early on, we just moved to Pandoc. And then kind of to make a long story short, we, we, there were, we, we created a lot of extensions to our markdown. We created a thing for making books and we created a thing for making blogs and we created a thing for presentations and uh, for, for um, kind of like fancy grid layout of documents. And, and so we, we had all these, we did a version of the Distill Machine Learning Journal from Google. If you've seen those articles, we Absolutely. made an R markdown version of that. So we kind of, we, we sort of innovated a lot in a very fragmented way. And so we ended up at the end of this with, we have this system that has a lot of functionality that's fractured across a bunch of packages with a bunch of inconsistency that's R only. And so we said that is kind of a dead end uh, in terms of having a, a bigger impact on scientific computing. Uh, and so we said, what, if we could take a step back, build a system that was agnostic to the engine, the computational engine, um, and at the same time, try to roll up a lot and synthesize a lot of the ideas that we developed over that 10 year period into kind of one uniform system, mm -hmm. then that would be, that would be kind of what we needed to do to really like continue investing in a way that we felt like this project is going to be meaningful in decades, you know, mm. so that, so we kind of, it was almost like take a couple steps back and that was a couple years ago, we said, let's start working on Quarto, which is a, 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 a language independent engine, we'll call it engine agnostic where the first two engines supported our Knitter, which was what we supported in our Markdown and Jupyter. Mm. Um, and so those are sort of equal citizens and it, it is possible to- Quarto, let me just get that up. So, yeah. Okay, so here's Quarto. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is what you're working on. That's what I'm working on now. now. So that's pretty much what I've been working on for directly or indirectly for the about the last three years. And, uh, and, and that's this kind of looks a, a lot like uh, Markdown. It does. Input. Yeah, it is derivative. It's syntax and 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 uh, an approach to things is to, is derivative of our Markdown. And so you've got some um, some YAML front meta, so some metadata which um, is supported by Pandoc, I believe. Yep, that's right. Uh, yep. yep. And you've got some um, Markdown. Yep. This looks like something that's not in any markdown I'm familiar that's right. with. That's right. That's that's a cross reference. Okay. So it's and saying it's I want to reference it, uh, here. Label. This is the label. Exactly. Yeah. It matches the code. The yeah. Yeah. And so now we've got as a result the markdown here, the metadata yeah. here, the yeah. uh, code is auto folding right. and I guess I can't click on this. It's just yeah. a picture yeah. but yeah. if I could. Yeah. And a hyperlink it's the resolved caption. the cross reference. It's numbered the figure. There's, it's only figure one, but if there were 17 figures, you'd see one, two, three, four, et cetera. So that's kind of the idea. So, um, and interactive and then, documents as well. Yep. Yep. So we do integration with observable and Jupyter. So really with Jupyter, we, we put the most effort into Python and making everything work great in Python. We've put some effort into Julia. Um, there, any, any Jupyter kernel works with it, but you, you know, if we do a little extra work, then it works better. So, yeah. Um, so, I mean, um, like seriously, anything works. Uh, I've been recently playing with APL and I've created probably okay, the okay. first ever, yeah. <laughs> uh, APL kernel. Nice. Okay. Um, and so here's. Okay. Yeah. Links to APL okay. Glyph documentation. Yep. Uh, here is a auto-generated cool. table of contents. That's cool. 
I've uh, not seen that. <laughs> and then yeah, here's a Python. Here's a Python sure. one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. So that's what I've been working on, and I know the the way that you and I got connected. Well, we got introduced separately. Just hey, you should get to know each other, and then we we got to talking about what yeah, we're I think that was Wes McKinney, right? Yeah, that's right. And uh, and then the author wrote sort of pandas and Arrow and such like. Yes, yeah. So so um, Wes introduced us, and uh, and it was like, what are you working on? What are you working on? And we were just you, know, and you talked a little bit about NB Dev two and literate programming and. And I said, well, you could, th this quarters might be related to what you're doing, um, but it, it's, uh, it might be. I mean, I already knew, very much knew you by reputation um, because I was not a big user of cold fusion, but I was an enthusiast of it, which right. you know, maybe right. we can come back to and talk about that. I was a big user of Windows Live Writer. So these are both things yeah. that you had built. And Windows Live Writer was something which felt like it reminded me of the original Mac OS graph calculator. It felt like better than all of the other things, like, cause it came from Microsoft. It was kind of felt better yeah. than all the other things that were around it somehow. And I thought like, how did something so That's elegant weird. and neat end up yeah. in the yeah. Windows, what do I call yeah. it, Windows Extras or whatever it yeah. was. Yeah. Windows Plus? Uh, Windows, uh, well, yeah, there was like Live the Plus, plus pack or the, something. Anyway. Uh, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Exactly. Um, and then I remember it at uh, University of San Francisco, one of our admin staff said, oh, there's a, it's got this request from a guy from, uh, you know, who's thinking of flying in for the lessons. Uh, you know, you might want to get in touch with him to see if that's suitable. And it's like, oh, who's, what's his name? It's like a some guy called JJ Allaire. And I was like, yeah, oh, JJ right. Allaire's interested in fast AI. That's really cool. I, well, I was very, well, what, what the reason I was going to do that was I was um, working on, I was working, creating an R interface for Keras. And so I had done the, we had done R, I had created the R interface to Python, which is called Reticulate. And then we built the TensorFlow interface. And then I was building the Keras interface. And I said, well, I'm gonna go take Jeremy's course in Keras. And then I found out, wait, it's not in Keras anymore. Right. It's, yeah. It's and, so you Keras, it, yeah. and I said, okay, I, I would still like to take the course, but it's less right down the middle of what I'm doing. So I, I didn't do it, but I, I, I actually had convinced one other person to do it with me. It Although you did tell me that some first day ideas did end up in some of your- uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so studying fast AI as we, especially as we did our PyTorch work and we, cause as you know, PyTorch doesn't, doesn't offer you much in the way of like a built-in training loop and, right. and it doesn't really organize your work. No, it's a- Keras does. Right. And I think we rather liked the things you did in fast AI. And so we said, let's, can we do, can we do some variations of those, um, you know, for our R interface? Because we clearly it wasn't enough to just say, oh, you can use Torch from R. I mean, it's for some certain researchers, it's fine, but not for end users. So, um, yeah, yes. I mean, I try to encourage even researchers not to just use raw PyTorch for everything because, you know, you, you really want to be incorporating best practices as much as you can yeah. and um, not well, spending. I, I, I did have a couple, since we're on Fast AI, I did have a couple of questions. Yeah, hit me. Then. And one of them is like, um, if you think about how you help both uh, new users ramp into things and make experienced users productive, right? You, you provide these abstractions and there's a dial of how leaky you want you let the abstractions be all the way from, hey, we've hidden, you don't even know if PyTorch is here at one end. The other end is learn PyTorch, then you know, learn our special shortcuts. And in the middle is somewhere like, well, PyTorch is present, it's not hidden. Uh, you can probably extend this with PyTorch. And you know, like the, I think different software design problems lend themselves to different levels of leakiness. How, how did you think about that? Or do yeah. you think about it? Yeah. So um, I've been coding for 40 years, you know, um, and I've spent a lot more time coding than building deep learning models um, yeah. and a lot more time reading and studying coding and, than, yeah. than deep learning. Um, you know, software engineering is based on our ability to make do good things with computers is based on being able to use abstractions. 
and those abstractions are turned are based on being able to use abstractions and you know so forth until yeah, you yeah, yeah. machine code so we're hidden um, we're hidden from the the hard disk controller you know yeah you know etc you know and there is none of those levels of abstraction is the correct level they're all correct yeah. for what they do um yeah. so with fast ai my approach you know has always been it's the same as all the coding i've always done which is if I'm writing some high level API, I write it using some lower level API, which I then yeah. write using some lower level API and yeah. so on until I get to the point where it's, you know, that yeah. each of them is trivially easy to use ideally yeah. Um, yeah. and is a kind of carefully designed set of primitive operations that make sense at that level of API. So for example, uh, the high level. So there's three main levels of API at FastAI, the high level, mid-tier, low level. The high level API is focused on applications. Uh, we provide support for four, which is vision, text, tabular, and collaborative filtering. And then there are other folks in the community who have added stuff around, you know, medical and audio and whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And in each case, you basically use the same four lines of code. Okay, so that came so from just like push thinking. button interface, if you will. Yeah, so like and, and the recipe, was, it's a recipe you follow. Yeah, and that was very much designed around the idea that one day we want to get rid of the code and there'll be a higher level API still, which is, is not code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. this um, is what I wanted to ask you. It will, when you finish, I want a follow up question. About okay, that. cool. Um, the, the, um, this is really important for stuff like deep learning because the more boilerplate you have, the more things there are that you can screw up, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so if you have to like manually create your validation set, manually make sure it's not shuffled and manually make sure the training set is shuffled and manually make sure that the augmentation is only applied to the training. And like each yeah. of those yeah. is something that you're reasonably yeah. likely to, to forget. Failure mode. Yeah. And yeah. when things break in deep learning, they don't break properly. Generally, they don't yeah. give you an exception yeah. or a yeah. seg fault. They just give you slightly less good answers it's or funny. misleading or misleading metrics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. yeah. So, um, so then the mid-tier API is the bit I'm most proud of. Um, and I find that's often the hardest bit to write. You want something yeah. that's extremely flexible and that you yeah. almost never have to go deeper, um, yeah. but still really convenient. And so for example, we've got a thing called the data blocks API, which came from me you know, I've been doing machine learning for, let's see, over 30 years now. Um, and, you know, I just thought back to like, well, what are all, what's the entire set of things I've had to do mm. to get data into a model training? And I, you know, realized that there was just, I can't remember, it was like four basic, four yeah. or five basic things. Yeah. And I realized that when I pulled out those four or five basic things, well, the 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 huge number of classes I used to have before I built the data blocks API, I realized I could replace them with just these five things okay. by yeah. putting the blocks together. And yeah. so I, I was able to reduce the amount of code I had by tenfold yeah. and increase the ability for me to write my high level API right. a lot and okay, then to great. give the same thing to all my users. Right. And then yeah, the, for the bottom level API, it's still above PyTorch. Well, it's mainly like filling in the things that aren't in PyTorch, but should be. So for example, yeah, yeah. I like using some object-oriented programming, and I yeah. believe that types should represent where possible yeah. semantic yeah. things. And that's yeah. something which at, uh, that doesn't really exist in PyTorch. So I added object-oriented yeah. types, semantic yeah. types to PyTorch. Um, yeah. Something that they've added, um, it's still not amazing, um, but we created first is like a computer vision library that entirely operates on the GPU and does things in a really efficient way. Um, so kind of stuff like that. So then the idea is that a user, um, we want them, if, if they're doing something supported by our application API, we want them to be able to use it. We yeah. want them then to be able to say like, okay, that worked okay, but I wonder what if, you know, could I make it faster by doing this or yeah. make it more accurate by doing that? And they can just pull out lower. one piece and yeah. replace it with a mid-tier API thing, you know? Yeah. And then they, so rather than starting at the bottom and then yeah. adding, you yeah. know, simplifying things with the high tier, start at the top, which is also how we teach, you know? Yeah. And then 
add in lower level things uh, if and as you need them. Did you have a goal, like kind of what I'm thinking about, like for leaky abstraction, do you have a goal where it's like, well, if someone has found, and, and I, I, I have not personally used PyTorch, but I use Keras quite a bit. If someone finds the equivalent of a layer, you know, someone has written a layer for PyTorch, they find it on Stack Overflow. How do I, you know, you know, reduce the error here, whatever. Oh, do this. Is it, you know, one level would be like, oh, you can literally just, you know, point to that or, or there another level would be like, you kind of need to package that. You need to put that in a, in a frame that vast AI can consume. Yeah. So um, everything, sh you know, the idea is basically that everything should be very easy for you to grab stuff from elsewhere yeah, yeah, and just use yeah. it. So we actually have, um, you know, uh, so we've got a bunch of integration, oh, yeah, for example, yeah, yeah. but in particular, you know, there's like, okay, what if yeah, you got, exactly that, yeah, that's such a great, a great, a great virtue torch. of a system. If it, if it can do that, yeah, then it, then it doesn't suffer from the, we have to do everything. Exactly. You have so to have for, special, special packaging, special wrappers. So what uh, I did yeah. was I grabbed for this one, I actually grabbed the MNIST training code from the official PyTorch examples. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and uh, they originally had it as a script, so I just changed it to a module, you know, yep. Um, yep. and um, so I, um, so here, here's, so this is their code, right? Yep. So I took their yep. code um, yep. and then I said, okay, well, how can, what if we wanted to um, replace their training loop mm -hmm. and test loop? That's a lot of code. Right. And it's also yeah. not a particularly good training loop and test loop with the fast AI one. And by using the fast AI one, you're going to get for free things like TensorBoard or weights, weights and biases yeah. integration. You're going to get um, you're going to get all kinds of metrics. You're going to get automatic mixed precision training, yeah. whatever. Um, and so the answer is that you can take all that train and test stuff and replace it with these two lines. That's great. And then yeah. run this one line. And this is now also going to run with one cycle training. So it's going to do a warm up. It's going to do a cool down. It's going to print yeah. out as it goes. And that's literally that's it. Fantastic. And it's the same yeah. for other things, you know. So for yeah. example, um, you know, you could, I grabbed uh, the PyTorch Lightning Quick Start, converted to a module. Right. Um, right. And so those I, data types, the data types one that line of code. Are, used, are used by Fast AI, since they're fundamentally the PyTorch data types, that's how it all fits. They're not, they're not obscured. Yeah, that's, that's either true or we create our own API compatible versions. Yeah. So for yeah, example, yeah, yeah. The, the, the PyTorch data loaders are things which take um, uh, things that are either indexable or streamable one item at a time and, and batch them. And yeah. uh, we created something with the same name. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, then, the fast AI yeah. .data .data loader, and then we added stuff to it. We said, "Oh, we 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 add a bunch of callback hooks that you can modify yeah. the data, you know, after it's been batched or after it's been turned into an item or, or whatever." Um, so the, when, when I was thinking about your your application layer, because I know, like in your course, you say um, you need to have, you know high school mathematics and some programming is what you yeah. need to to be able to learn this. And my question is. Um, you could imagine, and I, I don't even know if this is a good or a bad thing, so I'm, it's more just a question. You can imagine, you know, as you said earlier, an application that does, like, does transfer learning and, you know, takes various types of data that's well known and lets people say, oh, I'm doing computer vision or I'm, uh, is that the right layer or not right? Do you think that's a desirable uh, layer to have or is the, are you at the right layer now where the, the person will encounter enough complexity that they really best know some math and know some programming. Yeah. So you can, you can see where it would not be desirable to go further. Yeah. I don't know where you So uh, the answer is so far we've we failed at our goal um, okay. um, to make deep learning accessible because we require high school math and right. a year of coding. Yeah. And that's not accessible because most people yeah. right. like Absolutely. I think only one percent of the world has like that coding background. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so the, 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 the goal has always been to um, get to a point where, I, I use the analogy to the internet, right? So when I started on the internet, 
you would have to do it all through the terminal. And even when the first GUI things came in, you would have to set up like PPP configuration files yeah. and whatever. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'd read Usenet news with RN, which, you know, with all these arcane keyboard shortcuts. I mean, I loved it, um, but it wasn't the most accessible thing. Nowadays, yeah. you know, my mum, who's 83, uses the internet every right. day to chat to her six-year-old daughter on Skype and whatever. Yeah. That's what um, most, you know, AI should look like. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We're starting to see a bit of that with things like Codex and Dali Mini and Dali mm -hmm. Two and Mid Journey and yep. Um, yep. Yep. whatever GPT Three, where, you know, I don't know if you saw, but yesterday a, a book on OpenAI prompt engineering came out. Okay. Um, I didn't see that. Um, in fact, I'm going to see if I can find it because it's quite interesting. Um, and so basically it's like there's still skill involved in um, trying to create beautiful and relevant images using DALI 2, um, but it's not, um, it's not coding. Um, it's, um, yes. It's a different skill. It's prompt engineering. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And okay, I think I found it. So let me share my screen here. And this, I, I like this because we're all about um, we're all about uh, domain experts, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. so, <clears throat> you know, here's a whole book about how to create nice pictures with yeah. Dali, yeah. and it doesn't have. Uh, with lots of examples of nice pictures from Dali, yeah. and there's no code in it, right? Yeah, right. It's course, uh, yeah. saying like, oh, we've done some research to find out what kinds of words create what kinds of pictures. Yep. Here's some right. examples of that right. for you. And that's like someone learns, essentially here you learn a craft right. of how to feed the right sorts of things. It's a to totally right. different than programming. Right, and it requires like, a genuine understanding of domain. So if you want to create good yeah, camera yeah. shots that didn't yeah. that don't exist, you have to yeah, know how can, to about words yeah. like extreme close up and sinistral eight hundred T. Yeah, well, and, you can become very very good at this. You know, uh, extreme long and, shot. And, yeah. no, that's, and that's and like even like describing shadows yeah. and yeah. proportions. Um, this yeah. is what this is the kind of thing we want people to be spending most of their time doing yeah. and yeah. and also the kind of people I want to be doing it are domain experts in that field so we want right. you know um, product marketing people you know yeah. pro product uh, product photography people using their product photography skills to create product photography mock-ups we want disaster resilience experts yeah. to be doing disaster resilience we want radiologists doing radiology right. Right, 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 supported right, right, right. by yeah AI you know right so the yeah, so the the tool that you would build for for a radiologist, uh, I mean, in a way, you could even have it. You can imagine a radiologist is training a model, mm -hmm. basically. In a way, they're doing transfer learning. They're applying their data. They're 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 oh, yeah. You know, they're they're. But it's they're in their it's in their DICOM. Off. You know, it's in their DICOM viewer. You know, on yeah, their right. radio yeah. in their radiology yeah. workflow software. Right. Um, right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that that I think the answer is that you would like to go quite a bit farther than you have. Right, with right. Yeah. I don't quite okay. remember what we said at the time we started. So when my wife, Rachel, and I started Fast AI, we just, I think we were thinking it's at least a 10 year uh, yeah. goal and yeah. um, of making deep learning more accessible. And, and like our first step was, well, we should at least show people how to use what already exists. Right? Yeah. So that's why we started with the course. Yeah. That was yeah. the first yeah. thing we built. Yeah. Um, because also, that way we would find out, well, what what doesn't exist but ought to, you know? And yeah. so then it was like, well, basically nothing works except vis computer vision at the moment. We should at least make yeah. sure this works for text. So yeah. step two yeah. was I did a lot of research into text and I built the ULM yeah. fit algorithm and yeah. integrated that. And, um, you know, so there's a lot of research to do. And then, then it was like, okay, well, the, from the research we've done, we've realized that there's a lot of things that you could do a lot better if only the software existed. So then step three was to make the software exist, you know, so then it was doing a lot of coding. Yeah. And then, you know, come back full circle, do another course, 
you know, now showing here the best practices using everything we've learned and built. Um, where are we now? You know, and so repeat this. So we, we've, we're just about to launch version five <laughs> of this of this yeah. process, which um, except for a year off for COVID um, has been an annual exercise. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if in the next five years we yeah. have yeah. quite a bit of Both the like code free yeah. stuff that we're aiming yeah. for. OK, yeah, OK. All right. All right, my turn. If I may. Okay, go for it. Right. You got it. Yeah. I, I um I wanted to change track a little bit, if I can, um, to talk about your background, JJ. Um, and the reason for that is I like to understand the background of people who are doing interesting things in interesting ways. And like one of the ways I find you interesting is that your title is CEO, but in an interview I read, you said you spend about 80% of your time doing coding. And I know from personally interacting with you over a lot over the last few months on building um, NB Dev 2 that, yeah, I, you know, generally speaking, if before I go to bed, I send you a message saying there's a bug here, yeah. then by the time I wake up in the morning and say I fixed the yeah. bug, here's, here's yeah. the commit, <laughs> you know. Um, so that's unusual, you know, yeah. and yeah. I, I, you know, also it's unusual that I feel like you I don't know. You seem to do things differently to, to most people. Like you, 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 um, if you know, you feel more like a kindred spirit to me in a lot of ways. That like you seem to like doing things reasonably independently, but leveraging a yep. small number of smart people. Yep. Yep. Um, right. um, and you know, I was also interested to learn that, like me, your academic background is non-technical. You did you yeah. did pol sci. Yeah, right. I did philosophy. Yep. Yep. Um, you know, I'd love to hear like. Yeah, what 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 was your yeah. journey from yeah. doing pol sci yeah. to founding kind of three at least three successful software companies and now working in scientific publishing? Yeah, how, yeah. You know, how did that happen? Well, it really um, it started with um, well, I'll tell you, there's a, there's a couple of different um, threads that that come together. So one was how I got interested in data analysis and statistical computing was I was a huge uh, baseball fan. Uh, and I, when I was like 12, I got a hold of uh, books by Bill James, who you probably have heard of. And he was, a, he was a math teacher from Kansas City who wrote the Bill James Baseball Abstract that essentially created this idea. Why don't we empirically measure everything we can about baseball and see what see what's true and not true. And I, he was an amazing I don't writer. know any other sport that has a whole field of academic study of its statistics yeah. named, uh, you know, with, you know there's no sabermetrics, yeah. you know, based yeah. on that. And, sport. and he, yeah. he started all that. So anyway, but what was impactful for me was, I was also very interested in politics. My, my parents were political activists and was, I was mostly interested in politics. I was interested in baseball. I got the Bill James memo. And I realized like everything that people said on television, about what was true about baseball, not everything, but a lot of the stuff was just nonsense. The right. coaches, and players and broadcasters, nonsense. So that had a big impact on me. I was like, well, if that's true, then, then a lot of the things people say about a lot of things are probably nonsense. And probably data analysis is actually really fundamentally important. Um, cool. And so I kind of got, then when I was looking at political science, that was my lens. I was, I actually happened to, um, I happened to find a great mentor in college who was also really into it. Can I just mention, I, I had a similar background, but for a totally different reason, which is I started okay. at a big management consulting company when I was basically 10 years younger than everybody else. And they all worked using their expertise and experience, yeah, 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 which yeah. I didn't have. So my view yeah. was like, oh, I'm going to have to use data analysis because otherwise yeah, I can't be okay, useful. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I was anyway, political science, and I actually was convinced I wanted to be a, a political scientist uh, focused on date still focused on uh, on data analysis and things. And so I basically went to graduate school and to get a PhD in political science. And by that time, I actually had taken a year off and I had worked at the Minnesota Department of Revenue as an analyst. And I used a lot. I, I, I had done plenty of messing around with software. I had learned, you know, DBase and HyperCard and, you know, various other kind of you know, scripty things 
that a lay person could access. I wasn't, I had no training in computer science and I didn't take computer science in college, but I was able to get my head around things like uh, hyper talk and, and DBase and things like that. So, yeah. Uh, and so then, yeah, and SAS and, you know, all these kind of, I, I was so exposed. Yeah, and I remember and rereading you were doing stuff with SAS and SPSS, you know, which are yeah, also things SPSS, I SPSS, you know, Excel macros. So yeah. I ended up at the Department of Revenue. I did a lot of SAS. I did a lot of... They're very um, pragmatic programming tools. Rather very than pragmatic. Than yeah, ones, Quattro so. Pro, you know, all this. So, and so then I got to graduate school and I just found like, wow, I just really care a lot more about software right now than I do about political science. It was actually at that moment right. when it was 90, uh, 92, 93, uh, when, when com it was software was really coming into its own. Can, you know? can I just ask that discovery? Yeah. Were, were you okay with that? Because because was, I wasn't, you know, for it was me, hard to be okay with that. Yeah, I felt for me, I felt embarrassed. I and felt I embarrassed. To I did. I did. I did because my mentor. Like oh my god! I spent four years, five. I spent so much time with my mentor, and you know, I just was like, "Wow, this is. This is I know what I'm supposed to be doing, and this is not what I'm supposed to be doing." Right. But I really just went with the evidence of like when I go to the bookstore, I spend all my time in the computing section, and that lights me up, and that's what I want to talk about, right. and. I, yeah, I think said, you had more self confidence than than I did. To, well, to I also had a that. negative a negative experience with um, I, I, academia. Even though I had I had a couple of great professors. Um, it, it it didn't feel like I was gonna you know um, I didn't feel like I was gonna succeed. Even if I was into that, I didn't feel it didn't resonate when I got there. Um, and so I was like, well, I gotta, I, I'm not gonna do this, and I think I want to do that, so I'm gonna go try it. So I basically went off and said, I'm going to, you know, I'm not trained to, to write software. I need to learn a bunch of stuff. Uh, and I went and started, you know, teaching myself a bunch of stuff I needed to know. And then I eventually got bootstrapped into doing some contracting. Um, and then I, so I sort of was a contractor and kept learning stuff. And then I kind of, by happenstance and good fortune, ran into the internet. Uh, and I had actually worked with my brother on. So um, when was that roughly that you? That was in ninety. Yeah. Um, well, we got we got the internet at at college, my senior year. So that would have been ninety one. So we had, um, and then the web was ninety three, and um, my brother was really into the internet, and he was going around the Twin Cities. You know, he got City Pages, which is the the news public, the local, you know, the. Um, the city newspaper he got them to say we're going to do classifieds and forum and we're going to do all this stuff on the internet and then i uh, and he was like my brother doesn't write code so he's like hey jj you're you're a contractor what, you, what can we do this i was like sure yeah, I, I can figure this out so i did that and then i was just like and i the, the other thing that th the big thing that happened for me was that i was a fan of these tools that let ordinary people program I was a fan of you know DBase and HyperTalk and spreadsheets, and so I was like, that's really empowering. And so when I what, what happened was I said, wow, you know, um, my brother just told me he's going to learn Perl so he can write websites. Yeah. And I'm and I'm looking at what and I'm looking at that's what, what I did. I learned Perl so I could write yeah. websites. So I'm shoveling data in and out of a database and putting it through like a a, a template. Yeah. you know, and mapping form fields to data, like this is not, we don't need Perl here, you know? Right. I mean, it turns out to do to do fancy stuff, you need the equivalent of Perl, but to do the most basic things, you don't. And so that's what I kind of came up. And I, and I always, I loved the idea of, of tools and, and abstractions and making computing accessible to, and programming accessible. You know, I think people. the so first I, one of those tools for the web was, was Australian. It was a hot dog. Do you remember that? That's right. That's exactly right. It was. Yeah. Steve, so, somebody. Yeah. So I, I did. I, I, I kind of said, well, I'm going to take a shot at, at, at making a tool and see what happens. And that was Cold Fusion. So, um, and so, and that, I would say the other. The, so here it is, Cold Fusion. I, uh, it still exists. Oh, it's still, yes, it's still, uh, it's still. Uh, That's part of Adobe a, now. Developer week happening looks like now. So, so what, um, <laughs> yeah, what year was the first version of this? Uh, 95, 95. I mean, that's good longevity. That's good longevity. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, no, it, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's had, it's had a great existence. And, uh, um, one of the, um, one of the big ideas though, that I, that I learned, one of the things, the biggest things I learned when cold fusion came out, there were probably 10 tools that, uh, did the same ish thing. 
Was this and before or after front page? Because that was huge. It was already concurrent with front page. And front page didn't really do this. Front page was a- No, was it a, didn't. Yeah. It was much simpler. So it was, it was concurrent with front page. And basically the, the two of the biggest differentiators were um, we had were basically really good documentation and really good error messages, you know? Hmm. And we just, I mean, we'd see competitors that, that had twice our feature set, get no adoption. And, and what like, language did you write this first that was in C, C++. C++. Okay. So, I mean, which I don't remember a point at which you said you learned C++. I did, I did. When I left, when I, when I left graduate school, I, I, I learned C++. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It took a couple of years and, and I did the, the, the city pages, you know, project. And then this was my first serious project. And now I wouldn't say I was good at it at that time, but I was certainly enough to, to ship something. So, um, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so that was that. And, um, that was a great experience. And I learned a ton from that. I also learned that, as you were saying, you know, I, I didn't particularly relish the, the parts of entrepreneurship that didn't involve product development, you know? So, and there are a lot of those are really important things that need to happen. Right. So and nowadays, really I think you said you, you said before you, you delegate that largely to your, yeah. your president. Yeah. The, you know, the president of the company runs everything. And I, I do get involved with, the you know company strategy and certain there are certain things that are really important for me to be a part of, but then I try to to like preserve that roughly you know eighty percent of my time coding. And I actually think that the it's not a, just an indulgence. I actually think that great products need to have people who are aware of the whole matrix of what's going on. Why is this important? Why is this feature important? What users are important? How do users think? That stuff close to the keyboard is imperative and a lot of times that's that's that, that doesn't happen because somebody else yeah somebody else i've spoken to who has a similar approach is uh michael stonebreaker who's built absolutely yeah. a lot yeah. of the best database tools in the world um at yeah. many companies and yeah he told me he i mean he's also an academic you know so he kind of invents stuff and then finds a, a trusted partner yeah. to bring it to market yeah. with uh, i don't think he's ever called himself a CEO, he kind of calls himself CTO, but you know, it's yeah, his yeah, vision yeah. and somebody yeah. else is running yeah, the admin he creates for this it. thing and, and gets and has the there's conceptual integrity in what he creates and he, he gets all the all the trade-offs. I mean there's like seven trade-offs a day that you measure. Oh he's in Boston, day. right? Now I think about it. That's where I met Yeah he's in Boston. He's in Boston. Yeah. I I uh I met him once Hadley and I met him once. Um so um that was, that was mostly fun just to watch those two of them talk. Um, All right, but, I should let you have a go at a question. Um, yes, well, I was, I wanted to get into a little bit of uh, uh, getting back to NBDev2 and oh, Notebook. So maybe just to, to orient the listeners who haven't seen NBDev or NBDev2, I mean, I, you've taken, you know, notebooks further than anyone thought possible. And have created something really, really incredible. And Thank so I, I would love to hear, or I think I, other folks would love to try to hear general framing of what that is. And then I have some follow up questions about it. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, um, one of the best things I received was when the uh, original creator of Jupyter uh, and IPython Notebooks sent me an email and said this um, blog post, his printed out and put on his wall and he shows it to everybody who wants to understand what you know notebooks are meant to yeah. be all about um and basically the, the um i i really enjoy writing code in in notebooks um and this is what this is what my notebooks look like so this is a bit mm. meta here but this is um the first few cells of the first notebook, which is used to generate MBDiv. Okay. And when I first started, I didn't know anything about notebooks internals. So I had to figure out what is a notebook. And so I wrote this yeah. thing that reads a notebook. Sure. And then I look inside it. And as I do that, um, I'm a huge fan of um, the scientific idea of journaling, right? Most yeah. of the world's yeah. best scientists have yeah. Yeah. been very thoughtful about how they journal, you know. So for example, the discovery of the noble gases, you know, was something where basically 
you know, this leftover little bit of residue because the scientists have been so careful about the process and journaling the path, they recognize that shouldn't be there. You know, it's not I made a mistake, throw it away, but it's like, let's look into it. Like it's it it helps with the with a rigor and knowing what's going on. So I I like to document what I do as I do it. And I also know that at some point I'm going to want to share this with somebody else. I want to show them what I found out. And I'm going to forget this in a year. So I want to forget Germany year what I found out. But then I don't want that to be a separate artifact somewhere else. Like I, right. as I go along, I'm writing little functions, right? So initially these two lines of code would have been in their own cell. And I would have been, oh, okay, that's how you open a notebook. Um, let's make it a function. And so I chuck, yeah. chuck a def on top and give it and a And you're also to. articulating your understanding in-, in uh, Yeah, approach. exactly. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, I think it ought to give something like this. And I check and it's like, oh, it did give that. And so now I've got a test of my understanding and the API and I've got to check that it's going to be consistent. Yeah. And so that becomes right. a test. So um, so if I, let's actually have a look at this. So here is the, the, the notebook, which creates notebooks, which creates MBDev. So here's notebook number one. Um, and so we can then look at the documentation for NBDev. Uh, because writing documentation, like most people don't really do it. Yeah. You yeah. know, for well, that's well. what I was saying that the whole reason that Cold Fusion succeeds is because we wrote documentation. Right. Yeah. So you'll see that my documentation here is the same thing as the source code. And that's because yeah. source code and documentation and tests, they're all. They're all in the same place, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, and this is like, this is kind of in some ways a lot more the, than just literate programming. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. what I call exploratory programming. And it's this idea of like trying to recognize that programming is a process done by humans and that we can support humans doing that process by, by giving them tools that, that fit that process. Yeah. So that's really what MBDev is all about. And it's not a new idea. Yeah. Um, so obviously Knuth was the guy who kind of created the yeah. idea of literate programming, uh, yeah. combining programming language with the documentation language. And, uh, you know, these ideas that programs should be more robust, more portable, more easily maintained, and also more fun to write, yeah. all things I found to be true. Yeah. Um, when I'm writing code like this, I tend to be in the flow zone all the time yeah. because every line of code that ends up in a function, I've run it independently, I've explored it, and I've yeah. played with it. Right. I know how it works, you know, so I don't have many bugs. And if I do, yeah. they're not, they're never weird bugs I don't understand, yeah. you know, so I'm yeah. always progressing. So then, um, um, Brett Victor, who I yeah, really admire, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, uh, talked right. about a programming yeah. system for understanding programs. Um, yeah. And he has some amazing examples of Absolutely. like, yeah. what could programming look like in a way yeah. that's much more exploratory and playful. Yeah. Um, and so then another thing which was fantastic, my, my friend Chris Latner, um, built Xcode playgrounds, which again, it kind of lets you see what's going on, yep. you know, how many yep. times it's going through the loop and what does it look like? And so there was a lot of like, um, and of course, Smalltalk, you know, Smalltalk yep. was, was explicitly gonna... designed for exploration. Yep. Like yep. it's, you know, you have this whole- I was gonna to mention browser. Smalltalk in, in my follow-up question. So that's great. Yeah. That that so, yeah. Um, so there was all that going on and then perhaps most relevant Mathematica, which really, developed yep. the idea of the notebook. And I really yep. always enjoyed working in Mathematica, um, but never enjoyed not being able to do anything with it because there just wasn't a great way to like take a Mathematica notebook and give it to somebody else to play with. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. when Jupyter came out, I felt like, oh, this is a good opportunity to take these good ideas and turn them into the thing I've always wanted, which is a way to build real software, real documentation, real tests, but in this exploratory yeah. Yeah. way. Yeah. So that's what NBDev is. 
So you write your software in notebooks and you basically, you know, run a cell or, or a CLI command and it exports it to a, um, a module and that module um, in Python and that module automatically ends up on PyPy. So you can pip install it, you can conda install it, or it automatically gets the documentation website, or it automatically gets continuous integration tests. So somebody who actually just tried using this the first time a couple of days ago told me from, from zero to having a, a website and module and continuous integration done was 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, I believe it. And that's what you want, right? Because it's like, yeah. you know, you want to be able to say like, oh, I brought you a little tool. Here it is. There's the yeah, website, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah. Okay. And then when I get like pull requests, you know, they're generally good because yeah. they wrote them in the notebook. So yeah. they can see exactly what it's meant to be doing. They can see the tests yeah. there. They, there's like, yeah. they don't forget yeah. to write tests because they're in yeah, the same yeah. place. Yeah, they don't yeah. forget to write documentation. It's in the same yeah. place. Yeah. They understand the context of what it's about. So I also find it helps, you know, with yeah. open source collaboration as well. Yeah. Um, now I will say the tooling we built it on top of, which is largely kind of NB convert and stuff, the yeah. kind of, yeah the surrounding tool set around notebooks, I was never fond of. Yeah, um, yeah. It, I found it a bit slow and a bit clunky. I'm very grateful that open source volunteers built that stuff, but I didn't particularly like it. So yeah. then um, when I came across Quarto, um, well, the first thing I noticed was like, oh, this looks like NB dev. Like you guys are actually yeah. using cell comments yeah. Yeah, and just yeah, like right, we yeah. pioneered, um, which we got from, which we took from you. From fantastic, I, and I was like, "That's great," you guys, because we we were struggling with attaching metadata to cells, and as you know, notebook editors have a facility for that right. that Plus is you. hard to find and requires you to edit raw JSON. Right. So we said, "Well, that's exactly. not good," and so we said, and I saw you do that, and I was like, because people are using tags, they're also using tags. Absolutely. But, you know, and I was like, well, they, even the tag interface is really clumsy. No, it's really. And so I was just like, why not the comment? You know, I saw you exactly. Did that. Like, but you guys doing... do it better because I saw yours and I, and yours were like comment followed by a pipe sign. And I had always kind of struggled with this idea of like, how does anybody know whether something in BDEV yeah. is a how comment or a directive? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you made yeah. that explicit. And I kind of thought, I wasn't surprised, you know, because I kind of thought like, okay, JJ Alea, I've always admired this guy's work and he's now taken you know, I don't know if it's uh, now I know it is intentional, but I didn't know at the time if it was intentional or not taken my work and made it better. Yeah. And that's yeah, always, yeah. and I, th I thought that's yeah. great. Um, we should, we should at least use that syntax. Yeah, right, right, sure, sure. Yeah. And then I started looking into like how, what you're doing with it. And I thought like, oh no, this is like a whole tool set that does everything NB convert does and a lot more, yeah. but it's also more delightful to work with because it's got much better documentation, it's got much better defaults, it's, you know, the tool, the stuff that's built in for free is much better. And then when I spoke to you, because I kind of, I, I, I kind of said like to you, like, you know, this feels like something I could build in yeah. NB Dev 2 on, tell me a bit about the technical foundation, like how is this yeah. working? And you explained to me, and I started reading the source code to understand it, that it's actually this like relatively thin wrapper around, yeah, around fantastic Pandoc. functionality that already exists in Pandoc. That's right. That's right. It's an orchestrator. Yeah. yeah. Which, yeah. you know, on a bunch of good defaults. So like, it's kind of like what fast AI is to PyTorch in a way. Right. It's like, it is this amazing foundational technology that's actually just too hard for people to get their head around. Yeah. Let's give, like you said, good defaults, um, good ergonomics, you know, and it's the same same sort of well, thing. Well, and also Pandoc, I just, I had so many problems with it. Like, yeah. you know, when I used it, it just very often didn't quite work, you know? So you've yeah. also like, just made sure it, Smooth, it works. Smoothed out a bunch of things. Like, ooh, you know, that's unfortunate. Okay, make make sure that works, yeah. So so, so NB Dev 2 is basically like, um, should look very, very similar to MB Dev one, except yeah. for the the pipes after the comments, but yeah. it's um it's dramatically faster, um mm -hmm. part yeah. you know partly because, well, 
partly because I wrote a lot of stuff myself from scratch by yeah. by using yeah. the, the Python ast.parse stuff. Yeah. So I'm yeah. working yeah. with the abstract syntax tree directly. I'm making sure I only ever parse it once. I reuse the cache AST, yeah. you know, and then partly because, um, you know, we leverage Quarto, which is yeah. fast, yeah. much faster than NB convert. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's much faster and it's kind of the, the code base, even though it does a lot more, it's a lot yeah. smaller, okay. you know, than NB dev. Um, again, by kind of like trying to build better foundations. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, the, 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 the interesting, I noticed the, the title of your blog post was Use Notebooks for Everything. And I, I, I one thing that would be interesting to explore, so I kind of um, came up through this, this interactive computing metaphor, which was really defined by, have you heard of uh, ESS? Emacs, the Emacs speak statistics. Yes. That, that was sort of this Emacs mode for, uh, for R and at, for S actually originally, and then R. And it was a, a, like, it, one of the things that it, it sort of said, you want everything to be interactive and, and responsive and you're always in a live session. The way they achieved that was through, rather than having a notebook, they did line by line execution. That's like the fundamental model is I select a line or a group of lines and it can be sy smart syntactically like, oh, I see the line continues. Mm -hmm. And you just edit lines basically. And then at some point you might, like you did, reorganize that into functions and so on and so forth. And so one of the, my questions was, because, and I think one of the most delightful and powerful things about notebooks for, for Python is that they give you this interactive development experience. I sort of see it, and you know, Smalltalk gives you an interactive development experience with yet another kind of way of organizing the interactive development. Right. And so, you know, one of my questions is, and so we are building now as we build tools, we have this tradition from R of this ESS derived kind of like line by line execution. You see your side effects maybe in another 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 pane right. or in a, in a console, and then we have notebooks, and we're sort of trying to to, to tooling for both. Yeah. And one of my questions is, how much of the of what's amazing about notebooks. Like, so there's, there's multiple ideas wrapped up in notebooks. There's everything there in one place. There's bundling output and, you know, and then there's interactive computing experience and there's immediacy. Like- And there's the thing that a lot of people hate, which is also state. You know, and the state, state, right. And that's a side effect of, you know, it's all trade-offs, you know, and, and the state, you know, so um, it's like- Which, um, which I think of as actually part of what's excellent about notebooks. If you yeah. know how to leverage the state, it's actually- If you know how to leverage the state, thing. that's right, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. So, it's like yeah. your file system, you know, your home directory, that is yeah. stateful. That's state, that's also right? state. When you CD yeah, yeah. into something and you copy something, you know, it's, 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 it's state. And this is your home, yeah. you know, you on, made on, them on your you Linux made, box. You created a side effect. And it happens to be a, a you know a model or a data right. set. It's like whatever. this is what you this is you've created. And I get the, to have I have it now. I have yeah, it, you've yeah. created this environment yeah. to be in a state that you want it to be. Yeah, um, and, yeah, and, and we have not bad. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's funny because we have some religion, you know, in our like, well, you need to, you need to. And it, it's it's like you need to be able to execute the thing from top to bottom and have it work every time. Sure. And so, but that. But then there are people who say to you, well, I don't really want to do that because I actually, this was really expensive to create this piece of state. And I, I don't so much want to have to do it top to bottom, you know? So, Absolutely. so, you know, there's, I think there's a little bit and people have tried to build, you know, the sort of way to split the difference. It's funny when I, when I first uh, encountered these ideas, I was like, wow, it's so messed up that there's all the state. I was like, Mathematica must have some solution for this. So I went up to, I was at like some, some conference and I walked up to, I said, how do you guys do this? Like, we don't, we just, you just execute, you know, it's, you know, I'm like, okay, because it turns out, you know, if you want to solve that problem, it's its own quagmire. Uh, and people have reactive notebooks that, that essentially do solve the problem, but then are really painful to work with interactively, because as soon as you're doing anything that takes more than 10 seconds, you're yeah. now. Yeah. So, so can I tell you, yeah, so I'm happy. I, I can tell you a bit about my thoughts about you know, that would love to. That's kind of that. So that's like the set the table of like all the stuff that's out there and where do we go? Yeah. Know? So, um, so a lot of people are very into line by line based approaches in yeah. Python as well, particularly using the the IPython REPL. Yep, terminal. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, and it looks a, basically identical to how people coded in APL fifty yeah. years ago, except yeah. they used yeah. a teletype. 
you know. Right, yeah. yeah and it's yeah. based on that idea. And, you know, APL kind of invented that uh, way yeah. of working. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and APL was more than just a programming language because it was your REPL. That was also how you yeah. would like text chat. There was an APL command for that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like everything was, <laughs> yeah. it, that was your, yeah. that was your OS, if you yeah. like. Yeah. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but we have, you know, there are there are other ways, right? And so yeah. a, a notebook, um, you can do it top to bottom if you want to, yeah. right. but you don't necessarily want to because um, it's often nice to go back and change something a little bit earlier to answer the question, I wonder what happens if, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so you change that and you select the four cells underneath and you hit shift enter to run those four cells. It's like, oh, well, what if I did this? And yeah. um, and then you kind of think, okay, let's try three different versions of that. So you copy and paste those three cells twice and then you select them and then you run those with two different versions and then you compare. You're doing experiments, you know, yeah. and the yeah. artifacts of those experiments are right there all in front of you. Um, and that doesn't mean that then you're finished. Right, like yeah. hopefully you've learned something from that. Then you're you refining think, your understanding of the problem. Right, so later you kind of package it up a little bit. You kind of say, okay, well, for somebody reading this notebook, I want them to see these three different versions. And so like, maybe you put it into a little for yeah. loop or maybe you create yeah. some kind of function to display it and put it on a graph or whatever. But it's, um, you know, for, for, for me, like there, there are two critical, critical keyboard shortcuts in notebooks, uh, shift M and control shift hyphen. Shift M merges two cells together. And okay. control yeah. shift hyphen splits them apart. And so I'm always like grabbing a single line of code and I'm running yeah. it, I'm exploring it, I'm, you know, assigning it to something, I'm trying to fiddling with that. And, and after a while, I've got three lines of, you know, normally all yeah. my functions are three to four lines of code. I've got the three lines of four to four lines of code that do that thing. And I just yeah. shift M a couple of times, you know, indent the block underneath the def, yeah. add a doc string. And then all those examples, they're all still there underneath. Yeah. So I add some pros before each one. And that's a nice way of working yeah, to me. Yeah. And yeah. like, and as you say, particularly in deep learning, like sometimes I'll be like, okay, well, I want to show how we can interact with like a language model. Yeah. All right, let's run this for 10 hours, <laughs> you know, yeah, overnight. Yeah, right. And I come yeah. back in the morning right. and I've got a language yeah, yeah. model. Now I've got it just where I want it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe that's not a great example because I probably serialize that as a pickle file or something, but yeah, well, you don't necessarily yeah. want to run everything all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. an hour um, or 30 minutes might, might be, yeah. know, just make the point just as well. So yeah. I think there's an issue which is, it reminds me of my time in spreadsheets. You know, I'm a huge yeah. fan of spreadsheets, yeah. uh, even though a lot of people use them badly. Yeah, um, yeah. And um, I read a book, 30 plus years ago, which is a book of um, spreadsheet style. And it was designed to be like, you know, um, uh, what's that uh, English style book? Um, anyway, it's designed to be kind of like, you know, rather than grammar and style of English, it's kind of like style oh, sure. for, for spreadsheets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, it explained like, here's how you add careful auditing, error checking, right. self-documentation, whatever to spreadsheets. Yeah. And so ever since that, that, you know, I've tried to follow these rules yeah. for my yeah. spreadsheets. Yeah. yeah. It's it's taking a very flexible tool and using that flexibility to create a process for using that tool, which works really well. Same yeah. same with notebooks. If you yeah, you can shoot yourself in the foot with them, but that yeah. doesn't mean we should tell people not to use yeah. them. Yeah, we should yeah. help people. Well, you can use shoot them yourself well. in this. You can shoot yourself in the foot with a .py file, or or sitting at the IPython or a C plus plus file, or a C plus plus file. Definitely. Uh, so yeah, so two. we're kind of adding like more stuff, more and more stuff. So something that I've built as part of NB Dev two is something called Exec NB, which is mm -hmm. something which is just a tiny, tiny little Python module that just runs notebooks. Mm -hmm. And you know you can parameterize the runs. You can mm -hmm. and it'll it'll save the results back into the notebook. You know mm -hmm. with this idea that it, like you can very quickly and easily yeah. Yeah. run some experiments, share the results with people, and and um, NB any NB Dev repo 
I mentioned it creates continuous integration for free. That continuous integration runs every notebook top to bottom. So yeah, if right. your notebooks don't yeah. work top to bottom, as soon as you commit, you're yeah, going to find right. out. You're going to find out, yeah. So you're going to get so a master kind of, from GitHub. It's kind of harmless. Points. It's harmless to create an, a local out of order notebook because it's going to get checked. Yeah. So, I mean, yes, you've diluted yourself temporarily, but you, you, uh -huh. there's a net. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, so if if I can come back to Quarto a bit, um, JJ, um, I wanted to understand um, where where you're going with it and why. So you mentioned yeah. earlier that scientific programming is broadly speaking something you were trying to like yeah. improve. Yeah. Um, but Quarto is not just scientific programming. You've got all this stuff about kind of scientific publishing as well. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. Where, what are you what are you trying to do with Quarto and why why are you trying to yeah. do it? Well, it's it and I would say it's Quarto is much more a, a scientific computing, you know, that's what R Studio and Tidyverse and you know Arrow and all those projects are about scientific computing. I'd say that Quarto is very squarely about scientific communication. And I would say that um, there's a few things that just by working in the field for a little while, I have, have noted that I think like warrant significant improvement. So one is the fact that we uh, have scientific communication for a lot of good reasons is very tied to, to print. Uh, and that and the coin of the realm is these print articles. And that's fine. And there's good reasons for that. And there may even still be good reasons for that in, in the age of the web where where, where, for example, a PDF is a more durable entity than, you know, a website that might get taken down or, or have its links break, et cetera. I mean, but maybe, but maybe not. Okay. Maybe. So <laughs> Who knows? I'm just, I'm, what I'm saying is I, I've certainly seen some discussions where people say it's not a terrible thing to have a self-contained sure. representation of your, uh -huh. but whatever, Be better to have like a Docker image that, you know, can run everything and what, anyway, but so very tied to print. And so one of the things is to help scientific communication take better advantage of the web um, while still not losing the focus on print. So not going complete like, hey, everything in now and in the future is web. Well, now all of a sudden I actually can't write an article that I can publish uh, with that with that mindset. So that's one uh, one piece. Another piece which was huge focus of the R community, which is reproducibility. And this idea that everything should be in a dot, you know, in an R markdown document that runs top to bottom, where your figures and your tables and your your results and everything is all reproducible and produced by code. And so helping people do that is a big motivator. So let me come back to the first one, which is about yeah, yeah um, scientific communication, making it more web friendly. Um, yeah, I guess like. Why? Like, what's this got to do with our studio? Or is this like, what's this got to do with you? Like, what do you, well, why no, it do has you to care? Do with me was that, that to me, my own, my own kind of uh, beginning of the Renaissance was the, the, the Bill James baseball abstract, eyes opened. And then I get to, it's politics. And my mentor is, is, is demonstrate, he's also like, wow, we're making decisions that affect hundreds of millions of people with no evidence. Or making you know medical decisions with no not or not, no evidence probably an exaggeration but really weak under under rigorously prepared and under evaluated evidence and so to me it, it's just like doing science well has a lot of consequences I a see. lot of positive consequences. so this is like the stakes are high the stakes this is are high. this is a this is a this is a mission for you this is part a of mission. a mission and, to do and, science and, better that's right and John Chambers in his book uh, about 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 R and S uh, software for data science. He, he he actually has this concept in there, which I used in all my slides. It's called the Prime Directive, which is basically like accurate, trustworthy computing of scientific results is the Prime Directive. It's really important for the same thing for social policy, for medicine, for you know, just safety. Uh, so that's it. I mean, I was really compelled by that. So helping people do science really well and communicate technical content and persuasion well is to me very, very compelling. Is there and something about like accessibility there as well for you, like making it like making science more accessible and making scientific publications like more um, accessible? Not, like not per se. I, I'm taking scientific communication at face value mm -hmm. that it, it, it serves whatever purposes it serves and it has whatever virtues it has. 
I'm not, I don't, I'm not saying let's change that. That's not at least my thing, but I will say that another related influence was the, uh, and you probably read it, the um, Tufty uh, has this pamphlet, which is the cognitive style of PowerPoint, mm -hmm. you know, pitching, pitching out corrupts within, you know, and he, he sort of breaks down what's wrong with a lot of the way we communicate about technical um, information. And he sort of, at the end, he says, you know, really what we, we should be doing is giving each other handouts that, that, that have analysis and evidence and data. And we should be reading the handouts before the meeting and then we should be talking about them, you know, not, not pitching, you know, bullets at each other. So I was compelled by that too. So I, I was sort of very compelled by the idea, like let's give people tools to, to um, communicate effectively about technical matters and, um, and science. So that's, that's, that's very motivating to me. Mm. So um, I'm just showing this, uh, this is the tough yeah, it's, right. it's a really great, you, 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 yeah, they have, there's a really fun, funny thing in there where he says, here's what the, um, was it the Gettysburg address would be yes. as a, PowerPoint, as a PowerPoint, you know, presentation. So, and you know, it, it's, it's, um, you know, similar ideas, um, in um, like how Amazon do things. They, you know, they, they do a six page yeah. kind of memo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And of so, course, also um, Feynman, you know, in talking about the Challenger space shuttle disaster, yeah. felt like a lot of that problem came from you, oversimplifying you just, just, complex ideas. We, we just saw your, and I think you just posted on your blog about this, the ev evidence update re regarding masks and COVID-19, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Like, let's have oh, a right. dialogue about a, a matter of public health importance and use evidence and communicate, a commu do technical communication really effectively. The reason and I asked about accessibility is that, I mean, this, this uh, so this was um, an article that me and this team, this, this team and I um, wrote in um, April, uh, early April, 2020. Um, so, you know, within a month, really, of the pandemic taking hold in the US, um, well, within a month, um, but it wasn't published, I mean, it says here, except to December the 5th, and then I think it was published quite a bit later than that, maybe even. Um, so by the time this was available on the proceedings of the National Academy of Science, it was almost obsolete, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But um, what we did do was we also put it on preprints.org, yep. um, where it was there from, here we go, yep. 10th of April. Yeah, yep, yep. Um, and these were very minor changes, right? So, um, and, and this version, has received 439,000 views of the abstract and 98,000 downloads, which yeah. is the by far the most viewed preprints.org paper yeah. of all time. Um, and you know the fact that that was much more, you know, if we compare it like well, to well, uh, let me let me um, let me re-answer re a question because when you say accessibility, uh, um, I read that as the 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 accessibility of the discourse can a lay person uh, understand this right and that's not per se a goal uh, but it is but accessibility in the sense of the way scientific publishing works and the and the the, the delays that are inherent in 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 the, the progressive refinement of knowledge and the various choke points that there are um, for for publishing that gives people uh, credit uh, for mm -hmm. their careers that that is all kind of pretty messy. I don't have yeah. I don't personally have good ideas about personally about how to resolve that, but a lot of people do, and a lot of people are working hard at that. And yeah. so it is motivating to me to build uh, if I could build a tool that's widely adopted for scientific communication, then I can marry that to good ideas that are out there. Yeah, um, and make them easier to adopt. So, I mean, that's so kind that's, of why I asked because um, yeah, yeah, like that's it, kind it, of the number one goal. Um, even though we got to a third, but but, yeah. but that's it's uh, that, that's that's a hope that I have. Because like I mean, so I you know to be clear, I I I hate thinking about talking about writing about or learning about masks. I find them de yeah. tedious and annoying. But yeah. I, you know I have to because other people aren't. 
And so I just, you know, I updated that paper quite yeah. recently, yeah. Uh, but I didn't put it on a journal. I put it on our website yeah. because I felt this is more accessible. Um, yeah. Yeah. And also, because like, I just couldn't be bothered like doing yeah. all that latex well, stuff and yeah, blah, so blah, we blah. Have, we These have, are real uh, links to real, yeah. you know, anybody well, this, can click on it and yeah. go there. This is a goal we have, which we haven't, it's, it's not evident yet, we're working on it, is that you should be able to basically create a blog like this that's got this content, but and take this and repurpose that same content and send it to the journal. For, exactly. That's that's exactly yeah. what I want yeah. to do. It's like yeah. single source publishing where you can be, you can almost be web first and then, oh, look, we also know how to make, make LaTeX that you can submit to the to the other places that you need to get this published. In so, fact, I can show you how horrible this looks nowadays. So I did exactly that for, a, I did a paper about vaccine safety with my friend Yuri yeah. Manner. So Yuri um, wrote a study, um, or was a senior author on a study, which uh, for whatever reason got picked up by the conspiracy theorist world yep. as showing that um, vaccines are harmful. And so him and I got together to write a paper that said, basically yep. said, here's what that paper actually says. So this is, this yep. is the paper here, Lay It Out 2021. Um, but again, after, um, you know, uh, we actually wrote this probably in about April, 2021. Yep. And uh, in the end, I just, no, nobody had yet reviewed our submission. And so yeah. in October, I just kind of went, oh, fuck it. I'm yeah, just putting it on yeah. the web. So I had to take that LaTeX document. Oh, and turn it into HTML. And turn it to web. And yeah. I did use Pandoc to help me. But as you can sure. see, we yeah. end up with these like oh, yeah. ugly terrible. kind of references. And yeah. then I had to so kind of paste to, them um, down at the bottom. And then here yeah, they let me are. Show you. But they're go, not hyperlinks. Go to, um, go to the GitHub org. This will be out by the time this uh -huh. video broadcasts. There's a GitHub org called Quarto-Journals. Uh -huh. uh, and this should show you, yeah. So basically we're working on journals so you can see like, you know, uh, ACM nice. or uh, if you go to one of those, uh, let's see what it shows you. Yeah, so scroll down. Anyway, uh, it's not, it's not showing you much, but go to that, go to that template.qmd file there and you'll see sort of an example of, um, you know, you've got, you know, right. your metadata, your authors, your, you know, all the stuff you need to do. It's making the LaTeX that the journal wants, including get all, getting all the fiddly bits right. But then the same exact content is going to render perfectly in HTML. Um, that's great. It's yeah, going to do geography. It. It's going to do everything. It's going to do everything right. So that's, I think the idea is let's just write in Quarto. And now we're going to be able to put it in on, on the web, maybe web only, you know, but also I mean, we can, that we can, that world of publishing, my God, I, I was so shocked when I discovered how it works for this for this PNAS thing. And so PNAS is, I think, like the third highest impact journal in the world. And so yeah. I, you know, I thought, like, oh, this is going to be a yeah. smooth professional experience. Yeah. And you know, I did the whole thing in Overleaf and LaTeX and BibTeX, yeah. and um, yeah. which is fine. It was pretty easy. And yeah. thanks to Overleaf, you know, with all nineteen yeah. of us authors could collaborate by yeah. working on yeah. different yeah. sections. Yeah. And so then when it came to to um, publishing it, you know, I had to upload the rendered PDF. I was like, yeah. okay, so I uploaded the rendered PDF. I wasn't quite sure how that was going to help them. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, like a while later, yeah, they contact me and say, like, uh, okay, we now need you to like um, look at these questions. Um, yeah. And they were basically they had put annotations. In, in the, the PDF, PDF which yeah, yeah. is already kind of hard to work with. So I ended up trying yeah, to like yeah. reply yeah. in the PDF to the, to the yeah, annotation. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, and then yeah, eventually yeah. they're like, okay, now you have to go through and look at the kind of camera ready document, whatever, and, and look at these things. And they sent me back a, a Word document and they've yeah. taken the whole thing and redone it in Word. Yeah. And then, write okay, just wait, wait for it. So then, so then they're like, okay. They had a question about a reference. And they're like, maybe this reference doesn't really make sense there. And I was like, I think they said you're not allowed to use it because it violates some rule or something. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't want to fight about this. So it's fine. So it's fine. You can get rid of it. And they're like, okay. So what you need to do is remove that and then renumber all the references afterwards. Yeah, exactly. There's yeah, 150 yeah. references, and this is reference. Yeah, well, this is what yeah. This is what like of a proper. 
uh, you know, scientific markdown system. We'll do that. It will renumber everything. Exactly. We'll renumber so I just said, I just said no. I no, said yeah. I've made that change in in the LaTeX. Here's the PDF with the corrections. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. fix it. Well, I almost view it as like you have to give people tools that help them with the problems they have now, and you know, which is I need to interact with all these journals and publishing systems, and then you have a chance to help them you know, evolve what they do and help them uh, do things they never thought were possible. So I think that's one of the reasons like we, we are focused on really tooling LaTeX well and letting you, you know, we're, we're very focused on that. Even though we think, wow, it would sure be great if we didn't have LaTeX, we're not, we're not ignoring it. We're saying, okay, we'll tool that, and, but we'll also tool the web and it'll be great and we'll all get there eventually, so. That's, that's now, can I ask some, um, I'm very, very excited about this, uh, by the way, yeah. I, I, I love that, like, this is something I'm passionate about, um, yeah. in like a kind of a slightly a weird way in that, like, I'm passionately <laughs> anti how academia works yeah. to the yeah. level that everybody was assuming I would go into academia following school, and I refused to, yeah. on the basis yeah. that I didn't like how academia worked, Yep. and I've now finally come full circle, I am actually a, a yeah. professor. But, yeah. um, you know, only because I'm able to do it on my terms and I totally refuse to yeah. do any of sure. the normal things. Yeah. Um, right. So it's, it's great to have you involved in this fight. We are, yes, we are going to be very involved. In we have a couple yeah. of questions from the community. Sure. Um, so, okay. So this one is actually asked to me, but I wouldn't mind asking it to you as well. And then I can come back to myself. Um, yep. So this person said for Jeremy, your productivity amazes many people, including myself. Do you have any tips that might be valid in general? What does your usual day look like? Now, I feel the same way about you, JJ. I, I'm amazed at what you've done and what you do. And Hamill and I are both, you know, like, wow, how does JJ do all these things so so quickly? So yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear your- Well, your... Um, I would say that um, to me, the main lever, for productivity is not um, how fast you can code. That, that certainly helps. I think it's more uh, what problems do I choose to solve and, and what order and at what level of depth. You know, to me, uh, getting through a problem uh, or a problem domain is about making those choices. And there are, there are side, side quests you can go on that waste three times the total effort required to actually solve the problem. So I think that a lot of that just comes from experience. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's the choosing what problems to work on. And that I think you can, you, can, you can level yourself up by talking over what you're planning to do with other people and say, I was mm -hmm. thinking of trying to solve this and then this, and then they say, huh, well, why is that important? Isn't that only important to this? And couldn't you do, you know? So I think some dialogue helps. Inner dialogue is great. If you have a lot of experience, maybe you can get it done with, mostly inner dialogue, but talking to people. I think tactically, so then I think then there's just throughput. How much, how much code, how many features can you write? And I, I, to me, the biggest thing is just, you know, several hours of completely distraction-free time. To let so you, you kind of like it. turn off any notifications? Turn, turn off notifications, build up the stack, get your stack. So you got to get like in a pr proper head of steam and not let yourself be distracted. Do you and work at, at an office or you work from home? I do, I do work at an office, yeah, yeah. And I find that to be, to be helpful um, for, for, that, for that purpose. Um, um, I, do, I do have a, a good setup for working at home too, and, and it's separate enough from the rest of the house that I, I, can, I can approximate that pretty well at home too. But, um, but yeah, so I feel like, you know, I need to get four or five, six hours chunk of distraction-free time. So then it helps just to batch up things like, okay. And you can even batch up things by the day. Monday, I'm going to do all the fiddly bits and distractions and calls and, you know, mm. I'll, or Monday and Tuesday, I'll do that. And then I know Wednesday, I have nothing scheduled at all Wednesday through Friday and I can get two good focus. I mean, that is significantly more hours than most experts in creative fields say they can achieve. Like normally four hours seems to be considered about what yeah. you can aim for as a best so five or six is yeah fantastic yeah uh, yeah is that because they're because of um just just sustaining concentration mm -hmm. yeah uh, the yeah. yeah and it's not so just that, in like i mean it's like in in in, in yeah like the, the kind of uh um deliberate you know deliberate practice stuff yeah 
yeah, which yeah, is yes. kind of what four you're hours. doing as well. It's I, deliberate practice. I, I can definitely four hours go is normally what I, I, the no, best violinist. So that's just do, the helpful, whatever. helpful genetic attribute that I have. Yeah, that I, yeah, that. yeah. So, yeah. I can't do that. You know, I I very rarely could do four hours. I, you know, three is good for yep, me. Yep. Um, and you you try to get the three hours distraction free or? Yeah, I mean, and also. So I mean, my, my my main thing by far is is a deliberate choice I made as an eighteen year old to spend um, um, on average half of every day um, learning or practicing something new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is um, yeah it drives everybody I work with crazy pretty much um, because it makes I'm you not... a very very creative, inventive, able to see around a lot of corners and solve problems in ways that people. Yeah, and I know so... I know tools extremely well. I tend to know yeah, like yeah, all yeah. the keyboard shortcuts and all the tricks yeah, and yeah. whatever yeah. and all the libraries. Um, but it does mean yeah, people who are working with me and are like, okay, we're going to have this thing finished by Friday, and you're, you know. Yeah learning doing this right. new yeah. programming yeah. language yeah. for no obvious like what well, the they hell? need to look at it in the long view of, of and it also means like you know very often using a tool i'm not very familiar with to do something even though it would be five times faster to do it manually yeah but yeah like right. it's definitely got me to a point now where i find um you know the vast you know nearly everybody i work with i i just get things done you know yeah. often 10 times faster and it tends to yeah. work the yeah. first time yeah. and um i kind of often find when I do live coding or whatever, people are like, oh, I didn't know that tool exists, or I didn't yeah, realize right. you could You're use looking for red checks in that way, or. Yeah, and efficiency, and, and yeah. And then, yeah. so I think, yeah, I think something people would be surprised about with me, the, if people think of me as productive, how few hours of productive time I have a day. I spend a lot yeah. of time hanging out with my daughter and going for a walk on the beach yeah. and yeah. eating ice cream and you yeah. know like yeah. Yeah. try to be in a good mindset to have yeah. a good yeah. a good three hours yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's a very very good three hours that you have then yeah so. not many people have good three hours that often that's right no i i see that the, 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 a lot of people that i work with their days divided up into small bits and and there's probably not three hours of even of engineering in there and they're all broken up and yeah so and yeah. it's also a case of being good at saying no. Like I very yeah, rarely yeah, do yeah. meetings. Yeah, um, yeah. And if I do, I want it to be a good one, like like yeah. this, you yeah. know, like yeah, yeah, talking yeah. to somebody yeah. I really want to talk to about things I really yeah, care yeah. about. I, I, and so I'll generally, if somebody's like, can I get on your schedule for a half hour phone call? I'll say no. But, you yeah. know, if you send me some email, I, mean, email. Uh, I will yeah. respond, yeah. Sure. you know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, yes. So your brother apparently does some rapping. Somebody else wants yep. to see you doing yep. some rapping, JJ. We'll that, right? That's no, not going to happen. Gonna happen. Okay. Yep. So um, both both of us, uh, when making design or development decisions regarding NB Dev 2 and Quarto, were there any trade-offs that you yeah. struggled with? Yeah, I would say two, two trade-offs. One was going back to the discussion we had earlier about leaky abstractions how leaky an abstraction over Pandoc should we be? Because our markdown actually fully, pretty fully abstracted Pandoc. Like you, you just used all these R functions and you didn't even know Pandoc was there. And if, if any given piece of functionality needed in Pandoc, you know, you needed to address, you, you, you'd have, you need some hacky way to work around the fact that we'd written this wrapper. And so for Quarto, I went with a more leaky abstraction which basically says like everything that's in Pandoc is kind of their pass through. Partly that's because Pandoc had evolved. It used to be that it, it could only accept a lot of things by command line parameters. And so now it can take everything through YAML. And so like it, it became a system that you could interact with more reasonably um, without a, a special wrapper. And so, um, you know, that I, I, I felt like if we decided to try to wrap it, it was going to be kind of a losing game trying to keep up with everything people were trying to do was by making it leaky. We would sort of free roll on everybody's knowledge of Pandoc and all the things that are in Pandoc. So that was one. And the other one, I think, which we didn't really decide on until about a year into the project was how much we should be batteries included or how much we should be sort of extension and plugin driven. And, you know, extension and plugin driven can be very dynamic, you know, like the JavaScript ecosystem just like keeps evolving every three months. And it's always, 
you know, on the other hand, it's really hard for people to get their bearings and, and, and things get, and so um, we went on batteries included because we felt like we actually, it was a somewhat bounded problem. There, there was a bunch of, it was sort of known what the, what, if we looked at a bunch of systems, said it's a known feature set and the users right. are not JavaScript engineers, they're, right. they're analysts and scientists, right. they will appreciate batteries included. I, I would say as a user, I've definitely appreciated that. Um, I, yeah, I don't want to spend my time figuring out how to add a JavaScript-based syntax highlighter yeah, which, and a JavaScript-based yes, table of that, contents right. and which, exactly, yeah, how to yeah, modify yeah. the CSS to create a but, collapsible right, sidebar. Yeah, I mean, nobody, yeah, nobody wants to do that. I mean, you know, everybody needs all those things. So just, yeah, you know, yeah, you give it to yeah, me, so did, yeah. but you do a good job of making sure I can replace it if I want to. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there are plenty of things that I've wanted to replace. Yeah. And, and you know, so very kindly, one of the first things you did for us was you added the IPYNB filter right. directive, yep. Yep. where we now yep. have yep. a Python yeah, can... script that takes yeah. a student in a notebook and feeds back a student out a notebook Indeed. that's been modified. Yep. And yep. by using that, we can totally do anything we like yeah, between that and want. the Lua filters, the which Lua work filters, on, the, yeah. on the AST. Yeah, yeah. There's we nothing just, we can't we just, do. Yeah, we just introduced uh, recently sort of an plug extensions, which is basically it's Lua we filters. Saw that. Yes, they're installable. They're kind of easy to bundle, and uh, so that's a nice, uh, a nice, yeah. nice way for. Yeah, Hamel and I were talking about that this morning. All right. Yeah. So my answer to this question, I think you know, the main one is actually not just about MB Dev, but Kind of everything we do, which is in Python, there's a schism between yeah. treating it as a kind of a, a static language that you write a bit like Java versus a highly dynamic language that you write a bit like Lisp. Yeah. And um, in my opinion, Jupyter is best for the latter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And uh, in general, I like writing code using the latter approach. Um, I like to, you know, I like exploratory code where I'm manipulating objects and um, taking advantage of metaprogramming and dynamic features. Yeah. Yeah. The Python community has very heavily leaned in towards the former, you know, so mm -hmm. static typing and yeah. um, a lot of very more enterprisey approaches to testing and mm -hmm. yeah. um, documentation and lots of uh, single use tools with their own concepts to learn and stuff, you know. Um, so that's the big trade-off we've made is to basically opt out yep, of the usual that. way of doing things in Python yep, yep, to, to the extent yep. where we're almost starting to think like, should we describe this as a different dialect of Python because it's yeah, right. yeah, not particularly yeah. recognizable to. And, it, and you wouldn't want people to expect, oh, I can just pour in all the stuff that I'm already using. Oh, it's... I mean, it, no, I mean it, it interacts with it all fine, but yeah, yeah, you write but... it in a different way. So like yeah. if you're used to using VS code and very heavily relying on static type annotations, you're not going to love our libraries because yeah. they're so dynamic that VS code yeah. doesn't generally know what the hell's yeah. going on. No, it just no, kind no, of right. gets confused. Right. So yeah. where else in Jupyter, Jupyter always knows exactly what's going on because it can do real time introspection of, of, yeah. of the yeah. symbols. Um, and, you know, so this is something I've got to say about the Python community. There's this kind of basic principle that comes from, from, from Greedo, the original developer of Python, which is the, ideally there should only be one way to do it. Yeah. And, um, I don't understand how this ever became a thing because as soon as you say that, you basically turn off innovation because if you want to do yeah. something better, yeah. you're not allowed yeah. to because you've just yeah, created yeah. a second way to do it. Yeah. yeah. And so the Python community often is, you know, um, or at least this kind of core group is often quite yeah. anti fast AI stuff because we're a second way to do it for, for yeah. all values yeah. of it. <laughs> You know, yeah. we have a different yeah. way of testing. We have a different way of yeah. building libraries. Yeah. We have a different way of doing types. We even have like yeah. a different way of, you know, we have a Julia inspired type dispatch system. Like we do yeah. a lot of yeah. stuff inspired yeah. from non-Python yeah. languages. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's 
really problematic, where else yeah. R seems to really, just seems a much more flourishing, welcoming and diverse community than the it, Python It does community. feel that way. And, and there's a lot of different, there's a lot of variance in how people do things and it's generally ex accepted, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, it's there's a, a lot of stuff I'm jealous about. language where people are, people are all, always finding new ways to use the language's dynamic features to do, to express things differently. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things I don't love about R and there's a lot of things I do love about R. You know, like you, I came out of the S, you know, SAS, SPSS, Excel yeah. world. We used S plus, you know, back before R was really a thing in the previous yeah. startup. Um, that was my world for for yeah, many years, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I wouldn't say I, I wouldn't go back to it. I don't. I, I like yeah. the language of Python more, um, but yeah, there's a lot of yeah. stuff I wish I could have. You know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. everything that Hadley's written and, yeah, yes. um, and the community, <laughs> um, yeah, 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 the documentation, yeah, um, yeah. Yep. the formula language. There's yeah. been a lot of good stuff. All right, we got one more each, if that's okay, JJ. Okay. Oh, sure, right. that's great. Yeah. Um, all right, JJ, NB Dev 2 is built on top of Quarto. Do you have any other thoughts for stuff that might be able to build on top of Quarto that would be yeah. interesting to explain? I think a couple of classes of thing, and NB Dev 2 is an exemplar of one, which is, um, I, I think of it as sort of generation of web content from software artifacts. So I've, I have a software artifact. Uh, in this case, I have my notebook that, that, uh, that, that defines a bunch of functions and exports things, and I can generate a website from that. You could think of, you know, it, it has real-time elements, so it's not a perfect analog, but like TensorBoard, there's these artifacts created in a directory, and then they create this web experience from it. And I, so I do think there's a lot of things, and, and the Bioconductor project had this thing pre-R Markdown, where they have these, these S4 objects that were very complicated. They could have like gene sequences in them and all kinds of stuff. And if you just literally get, you call it a function, pass the object and it makes a website from it, you know? So I think that this idea of having different types of software artifacts and then just creating websites from them is, is really interesting. And obviously like documentation for a software package is one variant of that, but there are other ones. Um, and the other is, you know, we sort of promote, hey, look, you can make a website, you can make a book, but you can pretty much you can feed just about any publishing pipeline through, you know, from notebooks through Quarto into the publishing pipeline. So like, you know, you, if you've got a big Hugo website, you can, you can pump Markdown into that, or um, you have, you're using Confluence and you need to put all your articles there. You can pump things. So it's like sort of building these publishing pipelines downstream of Quarto to these other, cause it, you know, it's great that you can easily make a website, but oftentimes you need to get, you need to get your content somewhere else. And so, you know, hopefully we can teach people how to do this, how to do this. I mean, it's all possible. I remember you guys asked about Docosaurus and I was like, oh, mm -hmm. here's an example. You can totally like feed a Docosaurus site with Quarto. You know, I know how to do it, you know, um, but I got to right. teach other people to do it, right. so yeah. Yeah, yeah, anyway. great. And so then um, my last question was, Jeremy, NB Dev made literate programming in Jupyter feasible. NB Dev 2 improves upon that even further. What are some open research slash exploration areas that could help improve literate programming even further in the future? Um, that was one of my questions too, so that's good. All right, so um, I'm just gonna um, totally hand that over to somebody else much smarter than me who thought about it for okay. longer than me, which is Brett Victor. Yep. So Brett Victor has this talk from 2013 called The Future of Programming. And um, Brett, talks about <clears throat> this idea that uh, of coding being, you know, trying to work with a direct manipulation of data. And so I think to me, you know, as I say, it's not so much about literate programming, it's about exploratory programming. And Brett's given so many great examples of directly manipulating things to, to, to code. Yeah. But he actually shows these examples from the 60s, like Sketchpad, where Ivan yeah. Sutherland was directly drawing things on a display, believe it or not, to like, create constraints uh, and or to create automatic drawings. Yeah. Um, uh, 69, um, a, a prologue based approach to kind of describing what you want, uh, pattern matching. Um, 
Doug Engelbert's ideas from 1968. Uh, again, like all like manipulating things on screen directly. Yeah. Rand Corporation's grail of like building things happen this way. And of course, we've talked about yep. small talk. Yep. Yep. Um, and yeah, it's all um, immediate yeah. interactive responses. Yep. Um, and so people like Brett and Alan Kay talk about how we've somehow, you know, lost our ability to, um, uh, you know, write things in like in environments that look more like this. Yep. You know, yep. Great. Um, yep. Yep. I mean, there's a classic example from Brett Victor where he's designing a computer game, like a Super Mario style computer game, and he sets up this kind of time travel debugging type system, but it's actually shows you the exactly what would happen if somebody pressed the buttons you pressed in your game just now and like shows you where the characters would all end up yeah, and he yeah, like yeah, modifies yeah, yeah. them in real time and you see them yeah, moving. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, this is like what it should feel like to work with code yeah. is it should feel like this artisanal yeah. real Absolutely. thing. We're, we're, we're pretty far. It's funny, we notebooks are great and uh, data science repls are great. They are, they're probably like 15% along the way that oh, yeah. they need. At most. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about working on those problems too. Um, and Brett, so. Brett had also a great example of, uh, he had this um, award-winning iOS app for basically uh, uh, the, the train schedule, the BART schedule in uh, San mm -hmm. Francisco. And he showed this example in one talk where um, he describes how you could have written the whole app entirely using a kind of graphical object-y yep. 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 system. That's just totally unlike any coding that yeah. I've ever yeah. seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well thank we you, JJ. Of, yes. I appreciated our two-way cool. AMA slash yes, conversation. I, I think I did yeah. just reinvent the idea of a conversation. So I have. Yeah. <laughs> You'll have to see if you're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna promote it as a two-way AMA or a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All, right. All right. Well, good luck with the yeah. last. Uh, couple of weeks yeah. up to the launch of yes. Quarto. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks. And and we're, you're going to be launching right around the same time. So. Yeah, exactly the same time. That'll be fun. All right, mate. All right. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thanks.